sort of, I'm happy that we have this opportunity to do this. I'm happy that you're doing this, this work. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a really exciting time. Um, I think in all of medicine, it's an exciting time because, you know, more and more we have this really amazing ability to, to, to take new understanding of, um, biology and translate that discovery into, you know, really meaningful, really meaningful changes for patients. Um, and, and that's true throughout all of medicine, but it's, it's really particularly true in dermatology, um, these days. And so it means that, you know, conditions like vitiligo for which, you know, literally eight years ago, like there was barely awareness of this condition by the pharmaceutical industry. And now it's like, there's a lot of development happening. And so, you know, it's just, it's really, it's just, it's just really great. It's amazing at times. I, um, you know, uh, recently that I'm seeing people um, who are coming out with vitiligo, they're talking about it. And I see a lot of people modeling and, uh, you know, showing off their vitiligo. Um, I feel like this is perfect time to be imperfect. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yes. If we're, yes. we're queuing into those times, I um I actually got paid for having vitiligo a couple of weeks back, which is just so amazing. If it if it bothers you, then it's absolute. That is okay. You should not be made to believe that that just because it's happening to you, and that you should accept it and that it's normal if it if it if it does not bother you then that's okay also and and you know it's sort of it's one of these things because there's not a health consequence in the sense in the sense that that you will not get sick and die from having vitiligo but the but the problem with using that definition of you know the only thing that merits treatment is that which is going to kill you well then well then i don't deserve to have glasses because nobody ever died from not being able to see right you know it, it, we have to be we have to be careful about saying that the only thing that merits treatment is that which is going to cause you physical harm because a lot of a lot of what we do is just making life better. If if having white spots on your skin doesn't bother you at all, then that is great. You know, and we should all support that person and nobody should nobody should say, "Oh, what's wrong with you?" But at the same time, if having a white spot on your skin or having white spots on your skin bothers you, that's absolutely something to be bothered about. And so we should try to make it better. The reason uh, why I uh, initiated of having this witty talks is um, because I grew up with a lot of misconceptions, myths around me. And then I've always heard people talk about these things. And this is a generous effort to kind of bring uh, this myths and misconceptions and talk about it so that, you know, people with vitiligo have liberty of living the way they want to live like whatever they decide to live with vitiligo or not to live with vitiligo. I do have Rhea Agarwal, she's joining in from UK. Um, she has vitiligo and she's been a spokesperson for vitiligo as well. Um, I, we also have Nirjeet who's running five minutes late, who will be joining in um, a little bit later. Um, so I, I really wanted to get started with the questions that I have. Um, so more of, you know, uh, this is kind of a community approach uh, my questions are designed mostly to uh, towards the Indian community because that's where I belong. Um, and these are the things that I've heard into my community. These are the questions that my community people have and um, just trying to help myself and help others understand more about this condition. Um, so Dr. King, into your words, what exactly is vitiligo? So vitiligo is an autoimmune condition. So that means that the body's immune system is attacking 
the pigment making cells called melanocytes in the skin and that leads to loss of color in the skin or a white spot or spots um it is it is again I, I think this part is really important an autoimmune condition this is not something that anybody makes happen to themselves it is a biological condition uh, to a very great extent is uh, vitiligo being compared to other diseases such as leprosy. I did read through one of your papers about this. Um, and then just assuming that vitiligo is contagious, is it contagious? And if it is contagious, what are the things that could you know, transfer the disease or it doesn't transfer? Yeah, so, so vitiligo is not contagious. So, so uh, vitiligo, is an autoimmune disease. It's a condition in which the body's immune system attacks the pigment making or the color cells in the skin. This is not something that that somebody that one person with vitiligo can give another person so that they develop the same condition. Again, that person has the person with vitiligo or the people who have vitiligo have a predisposition to this happening to them. It's not an infection, such as leprosy in the example that you gave. So my next question is, uh, when, what is the age that a person can develop with vitiligo? So vitiligo can develop um, at any age um, in you know, again, in very, very young people and also in older people, it frequently, and again, you know, answers to questions like this are always a little bit tricky. It frequently develops in younger people. And so, and so, you know, we, you know, when you look at a medical paper, you'll see, you know, curves or distributions of when a disease manifests. I think most important for anybody listening is simply that it can occur at any age. And if it occurs in somebody who's four or 40, it's still vitiligo, right? It, it, it doesn't mean that something different happened because it started when you were four years old or when you were 40 years old. Uh, I did uh, notice that when you started talking about vitiligo before, um, you did mention um, if that this could just be called like a condition. Um, I do see like a lot of people calling vitiligo a disease. Um, yeah. I personally feel like it's a condition because I don't have any other health concerns. What is your take on that? Oh, uh, you know, I think it's I think it's really semantics. Uh, I think that it is absolutely fair uh, to call it um, a medical condition or or a disease um it, it a little bit um you have to get really into the weeds um if you want to separate those two things and say oh again a disease has the following properties and only if one of those properties is that somebody risks a very bad health outcome you know, do we call it a disease? Uh, I think it's okay. It's okay to call it a medical condition. It's okay to call it a disease. Um, and I wouldn't personally, I think probably half the time I, I use the word disease and half the time I call it a condition. Well, I, I feel that I do that too when I'm trying to explain my condition disease to other people. So I, uh, I guess we all are in the same boat about this. Um, uh, Dr. King, uh, is, is, there, um, um, is there some, like, what is the precautions that people can take uh, in terms of not getting vitiligo? Do we know that there are certain things we can do not to get vitiligo? So we don't, we don't indeed uh, know if there, you know, are any measures uh, that somebody can take to avoid developing uh, vitiligo. We do not have uh, any 
you know, what I would call high quality uh, data or high quality evidence that that diet influences this process um, or again that anything else, uh, you know, vitamins or supplements, uh, there's no high quality data that any of those things either influence one's ability uh, or likelihood of getting it or that those things would alter the course if you did have it already. Um, so this is the next uh, segment is like the most uh, exciting segment for me. Um, I know that you have pioneered Jack inhibitors and I'm so thrilled to talk to you about this today and uh, see what you could share with us. And I have heard a lot of rumors into the market of the things getting approved and the kind of treatments that will be uh, soon available for vitiligo people. And I am really excited that I get to talk to you about this. Um, I want to hear from you all about Jack inhibitors. <laughs> so, so the, the, idea for um, for using a jack inhibitor really emerged from the science that uh, Dr. John Harris uh, at UMass Worcester um, developed um, and in in um, in that work uh, there is and the work of others by the way um, there is uh, this concept that, a molecule called interferon gamma uh, is very important in making vitiligo happen. And now subsequently, there's been other work that another molecule, interleukin-15 or IL-15, is also an important molecule that drives the development of vitiligo. And so, so the, these molecules, it was interferon gamma that was driving this idea for me, but both of these molecules send their messages or communicate their messages inside cells via a pathway or a string of events mediated by Janus kinases or JAKs. And so this led me to think, well, gosh, there's a, this now goes back more than seven years ago. There's a, there was a relatively new class of medicines called Jack inhibitors. And I thought, oh, wait a second. Like if, if this disease or if this condition is happening because of a string of events and we have a medicine that can block that string of events, then why don't we try it? And I tried it in somebody who came to see me with very rapidly developing um, uh, vitiligo, and indeed it worked. We were able to repigment her face and most of her arms and the backs of her hands. And it was it was just this dramatic, this dramatic reversal of disease in five months that seemed you know inexplicable except that the medicine worked and and so that led to this sort of explosion of interest in this class of medicines to make this condition better that's so amazing and it's so promising like especially for people who are looking for a treatment option. Yep. Um, we did talk to Dr. Harris a couple of weeks back. <laughs> um, I, I, I know because I watched I watched the interview. Uh, um, uh, everybody should know that Dr. Harris is, you know, one of, you know, the vitiligo greats uh, in the world and, you know, has really dedicated himself to understanding this condition. And we, you know, we all have uh, so much, um, should have so much thanks and gratitude uh, to him for all of his excellent work. But, but, but go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Doctor, I actually asked following questions to what Shireen asked. Uh, yeah, like, when can we expect uh, Jack inhibitors to, like, be there 
uh, all over the world, like av be available for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so there is the 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 clinical trial that is farthest along is using a medicine called ruxolitinib, uh, okay. one and a half percent cream. Um, and this is a medicine that has actually been around as an oral medicine for treatment of a completely different condition for over a decade, um, but but has been developed now as a cream for a few different skin conditions, including eczema. And actually it was just in late September of last year that it was a FDA approved, so in the US, for the treatment of mild to moderate eczema. Okay. And again, the, the clinical trials in vitiligo are done. We've seen we've seen some of these results presented. It like it's so promising because it works quite well on the face. Um, and and so, you know, fingers crossed in the next six months or so, we're going to see again in the US approval of it for vitiligo in the um, United States, where obviously I can speak the best uh, um, about how we do things here. Um, we can have medicines like ruxolitinib or like other JAK inhibitors, tofacitinib, we can have them compounded. So we can have them, you know, we can have a pharmacy, a licensed pharmacy, make these into a cream for people to use. And, and you know, I've been doing this for years um now and and that's a possibility oral options oral jack inhibitors uh we're gonna see there's there's a a clinical trial that um is ongoing with an investigational um jack inhibitor for the treatment of vitiligo and again time will time will tell uh but but kind of getting back to an earlier point it's like the ball's rolling you know the world is aware of vitiligo the pharmaceutical industry is aware of vitiligo it's like there's momentum we're going to do this and for again availing this medicine one will have to see a dermatologist first and then uh, only they can be prescribed this medicine uh, am i right I think so. Yes, I, for, for sure. The, these will be medicines. These medicines should be only prescribed, I would say, by uh, a medical doctor. Um, and and this this, you know, there may be questions about safety in general of jack inhibitors or of this class of medicines. But, you know, this is not something one. Right. You always want to know that you're treating what you think you're treating. And so, so I, you know, personally, I believe that people with white spots on their skin should see a, should see a dermatologist. And uh, Dr. Other than uh, Jack inhibitors, is there something else also that is like that would eventually cure vitiligo uh, once and for all? Like, do you, oh, can that you is, that is, that's the really big question. Um, um, and, um, so, so here, so I think it's always really useful, really helpful to differentiate treatment from cure you know, treatments for psoriasis. We now have 11 treatments for psoriasis. They work exceptionally well, but when you stop them, your psoriasis comes back. And so, and so for me, I think, I think you know, let's not yet talk about cure. Let's talk about effective treatment. We have to get effective treatment before we get to cure. Um, that is something that we're investigating right now. John Harris, together with um, the NIH, um, they, they, in a sense, kind of partnered to develop a clinical trial using uh, an IL-15 inhibitor. So I mentioned IL-15 earlier as being one of the important molecules that we think drives vitiligo to happen. There's a possibility that using an antibody or a protein that, that, um, that kind of takes uh, IL-15 away, that we might be able to turn off vitiligo for a long period of time. That clinical trial is happening right now. We're in the middle of it. And hopefully in two years or so, we'll have 
will have uh, results to report. Seven okay. years ago, these conversations weren't happening because, you know, we, we were giving people light therapy, which is not to say light therapy doesn't work for some people. It does work for some people, but we knew so little about why vitiligo happened, which, and, and you know, this is the problem, right? When we don't have knowledge, myths get perpetuate, right? It, absence of knowledge permits, just creates a void. And into that void, people will, people will put all kinds of, of, you know, thinking and, you know, now all of a sudden myths develop. And then there are a lot of, unfortunately, because vitiligo creates so much desperation, you have then people who feed on that desperation and say, oh, I can make you better with this cocktail. Oh, I can make you better. Just don't do that. I have something to sell you. And, and, and that, you know, that kind of predatory behavior, oh, it just begets more myth-making and, you know, and difficulty for everybody. But, but I feel like with new, you know, really good knowledge, we're going to be able to start. And I think if this is the work that you all are doing, we're going to be able to kind of start to unravel all uh, and undo all of the myths and 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 create awareness um and and there will be treatments and that will permit you know all of us to move forward in a more useful way in a more healthy way right uh, Dr. One more question. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, as you said, that it is best if you educate yourself, if you you know read about it and like spread awareness. Is there some blog? Is there some article? Is there something specific that you suggest that one should definitely read about with LIGO so as to clear their myths and misconceptions and all of those things like is there a book is there a podcast like anything you know so so one i mean again i know i keep saying this but i really love the work that you guys are doing and i think that this is a great place to go and actually hear from people who have you know really spent a lot of time seeing you know tens hundreds thousands of patients and thinking a lot about this this is a you know, a super important uh, medium to spread awareness, but also, uh, you know, a really great place. Um, the Global Vitiligo Foundation has okay. um, has a website um, where, you know, they just have, you know, all of the big questions that people ask with bulleted answers. So, you know, if all you have is five or 10 minutes, that's a great resource. Another great resource is John Harris has a, a bit of a blog, you know, kind of a vitiligo question and answer um, um, uh, place um, on the internet. And again, I think I, I really, I really encourage people to, to seek information from these places because Oh, there's just, there's just so much misinformation. There's just so much misinformation and, and, and you really, you, you really want everybody, everybody, no matter what ails you, whether it's vitiligo or something else, you want, you want truth. You want the data that really exists, not just what somebody said, uh, not what somebody's single experience was but you want data collected from many, many, many people and vetted. Um, and so I really like those, those sources of information. When you have it, then uh, more likely your kids will have it. Mm -hmm. Because I've not had it when I, I wasn't born with it. So I got it when I was about nine years old. So is that myth true or? Like, what is the logical explanation there? Yep, yep, yep. So, you know, the numbers. So about 1% of 
of people will develop vitiligo. Okay, so if you take 100 people, uh, probably, you know, over time, if you give enough time, one of them is going to develop vitiligo. About 15% of people with vitiligo can identify a family member with it. Okay, so that's the second, the second piece of, of information. And then I think, I think the most, the most revealing, the most revealing statistic is that if you have identical twins, okay, so, so two people, literally their, I, their, their genetics are the same, one of them develops vitiligo, the chance of the other one developing vitiligo is a little more than 20%. So kind of a one in five chance. And so for, for me, what, what this highlights is that, is that there's a genetic predisposition to it, but that it's really complicated genetics. Just because you have, just because you have the genes doesn't mean that it will happen, right? There are other factors that play into it. Is there anything that you shouldn't really eat that you think uh, while having vit vitiligo? Right, so I would... there's no data at all that says uh, that, that we can, or that one can affect their, uh, their vitiligo and by the way, probably most other autoimmune diseases by simple changes in diet or that by avoiding a certain food that <laughs> your condition is going to be better or go away. You know, there we, we, we frequently make these associations right and if you're if if you're desperate to understand why something is happening something that is out of your control then you start looking in your environment for things that happened recently right and diet or food intake is a really easy place to go and say oh geez well i you know i noticed that you know after i did this after i ate that this happened. The problem is you might be forgetting about, you know, the other thousand things that you did or ate. Um, and so, and so again, I think there's no really good data that says that by eating something or not eating something else, or that by taking a vitamin or a supplement that anybody is likely to change the course of their vitiligo. Anxiety and stress, life is stressful enough. You know, control the things that we can, let yeah. go of the things that we cannot control, chase knowledge, chase real data, and, and try as much as we can to let go of the misinformation and the other things that we gather, you know, while we're trying to sort out life. No, I totally agree with that. Um, uh, I think uh, my one more question was, because, um, I mean, being a doctor and you've researched on this quite a lot, um, how do you think vitiligo happens to one person? How does it happen? Why does it happen? What are the symptoms? What are the things that is actually causes the vitiligo in someone's body? Yeah, I, you know, I... I... I'm afraid that my answer is going to be really, uh, um, really sort of uh, kind of unrevealing because I, I really believe, I really believe, and, and again, there's, there's good data to support this, that people with vitiligo likely have the right genetics, right? They, their DNA, you know, the, 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 what makes them who they are has a set of elements such that when when many of those elements turn on their immune system doesn't behave normally 
And one of the outcomes is that the immune system attacks the color cells of the skin and makes white spots. And, and I don't, I don't believe that there is anything that is in our control mm -hmm. to make those genes turn on or off. And so I think, I think that this is, you know, these are factors beyond our control uh, that make the little biological on and off switches happen. Um, but that it's nothing, it's nothing that somebody does. It's nothing that somebody does wrong. And it's simply out of our control. But, but, but again, this goes back to an earlier part of the conversation. Just accept yourself if that is what you want for yourself i you know here i think that this is really this is really important i i feel like nobody should be shamed for wanting their skin to be like it used to be mm. and and similarly similarly nobody should be shamed because their skin looks the way it does with a white spot yeah. or with white spots I, you know this is the thing we should you know what we want to do is spread awareness so that everybody understands that okay well this just happened nothing is wrong with this person it just happened it's not contagious and what i want for everybody is for everybody to maximize their potential be as happy as they can be in the world and if being as happy as you can be, your white spots are irrelevant, then good for you. That's awesome. Yeah. If maximizing your potential means let's try to erase the white spots, then let's come up with solutions to erase the white spots. <clears throat> um, uh, vitiligo, does it, does it weaken your immune system or? Think of autoimmunity as as a misbehaving immune system i don't think of it as an overactive immune system i don't think of it as as an underactive immune system it's simply a misbehaving immune system this idea right if you think about it as being overactive well then you might you might think well then maybe with the no, people with an overactive immune system, maybe they wouldn't otherwise get sick, right? They wouldn't get infections. They would never be, they would never develop cancer because their overactive immune system would be running around their body, always stamping out little fires before they develop. Again, I don't think that that's what's happening in vitiligo. I think the immune system is misbehaving in a very particular way. It's targeted a cell again the melanocyte or the color cell in the skin and and for some reason identified that that cell is bad and so it chases and finds those cells and stamps them out and that leads to a white spot and it's very important um, um you know so much of life is um you know when you have something it's important to know that you're not alone um, um and 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 then you know the next step after that is is data gathering and and this is i think such an amazing opportunity um even even if you know you know speaker after speaker um you know people hear the same things that's really important right because it means it means that that's you know it gives some credibility uh, to the idea, it kind of makes it more real. It's like, oh, geez, person after person says this. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, again, I, I'm, I'm sincerely appreciative of the opportunity to be here and, um, and really keep up the good work.